Thank you very much for joining us, Sarah Jane. Sarah Jane is the uh, artist curator and organizer of Lacuna International Art Festivals. Sarah, could you tell us a bit about your background, please? Of course. Um, so thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. I really appreciate being here. Um, my name is Sarah Jane Mason, and I'm an artist, educator, um, curator, um, a director, a facilitator. I seem to have all of these different types of um, labels. Um, my background is in fine arts. Um, I went to art college um, and then Leeds um, and Liverpool universities. And then I did my postgraduate studies in Cyprus. Um, I'm also a qualified teacher. I taught full time for five years before becoming a freelance creative practitioner, facilitator and educator, which I've been doing for, oh gosh, such a long time. I'm getting old, 10 mm -hmm. years now. <laughs> Goodness. I mean, it sounds like you've had such fantastic experiences, both of learning and, you know, of in the art world as well. Um, and you said you have a background in education. So how does art and education, your background as a teacher, how does that complement each other, Sarah? So there's, there's so much stuff that I um, still use today that I learned during my postgraduate um, teaching diploma. Um, I mean, from really practical things like organization and time management um, to the contacts I made during networking, but also to really important kind of pedagogical theories and strategies that I still employ when I am preparing and delivering arts education workshops and programs. Um, I still do a fair bit of that in the UK for national portfolio organisations like the Yorkshire Sculpture Park um, and for Leeds Art Gallery, the Tetley and various other um, museums and galleries, as well as educational establishments. So for me, art and education come as a package. Um, creativity is in absolutely everything. And if it's not, it probably should be. Um, and I really believe that it needs to be re-injected into the curriculum. That's amazing. I think it's just you're doing so much and you're giving so much back, you know, to in terms of the workshops that you're doing in terms of art, um, in, in terms of the artscape. So how did this idea for Lacuna Festivals, how did that come up? It's really interesting that you linked it like that, actually, because it, it came about because I was being given so much from artists who are older than me, who were giving me opportunities um, and providing me with inspiration and links and really giving me a lot. Um, and one of those artists um, is Professor Kenneth G. Hay, and he runs a, a similar grassroots style art festival called the La Rock Art Festival, which he ran for, it's actually finished for the minute, he's taking a break, but he ran it for 10 years. And I participated for, I think, eight of those years. Um, yeah. And when I decided that I was going to spend some of my time in Lanzarote and have a studio base here, um, it was Ken that said, you know, you should think about doing an art festival. I'll help you get set up. And so our first year in 2019 was actually a twin festival with the La Rock Arts Festival. And I can't even begin to tell you how much Ken helped us out, um, really showed us the ropes. And so it feels now like it's starting to come sort of full circle. You know, I feel like now I'm able to be the person doing some of the giving. And I think that in the art world, that's really, really important. Art's become such a commodity and such a, a sort of commercial product in the business that that spirit is really important to keep hold of. I think it's absolutely amazing, um, especially, you know, when you talk about quality art as well, and you, you, you're talking about art really for art's sake rather than just as a commodity, you know. Um, you have fantastic energy, Sarah, you know, 
Um, you have really, um, I've noticed through the Latino festivals, really well organized, really well structured. Um, it's just 360, it's just very smoothly run. However, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, yeah, it's definitely not smooth sailing. So I appreciate all the compliments. I think that we must run it a bit like how a duck is in water, you know, on the surface, it looks all calm. And underneath, we're just like paddling away. Um, particularly to start with, there were a lot of challenges. We had only been in Lanzarote for eight months when we ran our first festival. Um, at that point, my grasp of the local language, which is Spanish, was very, very basic. I had no idea of the types of venues that were available here and how I could approach them um, or any of the procedures. Um, so we had to learn a lot really, really quickly. And then that first year was just incredible. It was like, it, it felt like we were sort of riding this wave somehow. And then of course the pandemic, pandemic came and um, then that brought a whole new range of challenges because all of a sudden we were having to learn how to use virtual gallery spaces, how to still reach and connect with artists, even though these artists now didn't actually have a physical base to come and potentially meet each other. Um, but through these challenges, I feel like we have learned a lot. I feel like every year we learn, you know, and I think that that's really important to keep an open mind and all of the challenges that come up every year, there's always challenges. We kind of try and tackle them with a smile and just do the best we can. I think it's absolutely amazing, you know, um, in terms of how you started off and the the great success. I'm sure every every festival has been a success in its own right. Um, however, what were some of the achievements that really stood out for you? Um. I think in that first year, we had no idea what the response was going to be. We thought maybe we'd have, you know, maybe 10 or 15 artists and that most of them would be people that we knew. And actually that first year we had over 100 artists. Um, and so that felt like a real achievement. Um, and it also felt like that meant there was a need for this. It wasn't just something that we felt as artists needed to be there. It was something that other artists felt needed to be there as well. And so um, recognizing that and doing something about it, um, I think to us feels like a real achievement. That's brilliant. And I'm sure it makes um, a difference, you know, to the artists that are involved, um, as, as well as, you know, um, to the audience as well, to see such a wide array of work. Um, what is the thought process behind the theme for each annual Latino festival? Because every year you have a different theme. So what thought, thought process, uh, processes sorry, go into that? The first year in 2019, as it was a twinned festival and it was Ken that had the experience um, and he'd already set his theme, we simply mirrored that theme. So surface and support was something that he'd already developed. Um, and ever since then, we have actually taken artist suggestions for the theme and then taken a public vote. And so we don't have any more say in it than any other participating artist. It's simply the one that gets the most votes. That's the one that we go with. Um, and so far, we've had a really interesting um, selection of ideas for themes and we look forward to getting some more interesting um suggestions this year that's that's incredibly amazing come into being for this year? So Clash came about, it was actually the suggestion of um, a German born but Lanzarote resident printmaker called Elizabeth Kirschbaum, who I met through the, through the festivals and she suggested 
um, the theme Clash, and that was the one that got the most votes. Um, and it was really interesting because actually this year, the other suggestions also got lots of votes. So it was really close this year. And it wasn't until the deadline that we knew um, what what the theme was going to be. So this year it was as exciting for us as everyone else because we really didn't know pretty much until the announcement um, which theme was going to win. That does sound like, you know, it was a, a close call um, in terms of the theme for this year. Sounds like you're working with, you know, a Annam. Hi, Sarah. I think I lost you there. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, I can now. I think it just cut out. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's okay. I'll trim it. No problem. If there's any or anything, I can trim it. That's not a problem. So I, I, I was saying, um, you know, you're working with the diverse global art community. You're working with different artists from different locations. Um, what is that like? Um, it's oh, it's so many things. It's it's really exciting and also quite educational because there's so many different perspectives and viewpoints. Um, you know, things that I would never have considered or things that just aren't part of my real life lived experience but very much are part of other people's experience um, and so that's really exciting and really educational um, it is challenging at times because obviously we work across multiple time zones with multiple languages um, not all platforms are available in every country um, this year for example the illegal war in the Ukraine has caused a lot of issues for artists from the Ukraine, from Belarus and from Russia. Um, and these are things that we have to respond to as and when they, they happen. Um, but what we really hope is that although our artists might be from all over the world, we hope that they feel like this is a community that they are a part of um, and that every person is valued and, um, and needed, you know? I think that's so incredibly important and of course you know global events do affect um, you know the art community as well and the fact that you're sensitive to that the fact that you're taking that into account you know that sense of perspective and insight um, I think it, it it should be highlighted and we need more of that in the art world we need more of that understanding um, because that is what goes into, like you said, creating that community, especially for, you know, creating an international art community, um, which you are doing every year. Um, so how do you manage your time and resources sort of organizing such great um, events? Um, it's, this is a really difficult thing to do, actually. Um, I think that the thing that we have on our side is that we work really well as a partnership. We have quite opposite skill sets. And so we fit quite nicely together as a team. Um, and yeah, we've known each other for a long time now. Um, and so we're quite intuitive in the way that we work, which means that a lot of time is saved just because we're already on the same page. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that the festival is growing and growing every year and everything is done between Simon and myself. Um, we have very little in the way of external support, perhaps a couple of volunteers to pour wine at the inauguration or something like this for the physical mm -hmm. exhibition. But other than that, it really is um, a two-man team. And this year there were quite a lot of um, life challenges, shall we say, that got thrown in the way and really disrupted the balance. And so um, I think this year for Simon, he would say that 
Um, he probably hasn't managed his time and resources. He's just done nothing else. Pretty much for three months, this has been his his life. It's phenomenal, Sarah, you know, um, in terms of you managing this, like you said, as, as a two-person team, um, to pull off something on an international scale with such high quality and you know uh, it's very interactive as well you have a lot of public engagement with that in terms of the artist community and I can see you know in the way the festival pan out it's very interactive it's very sort of um you know as an active participant what are your future plans going forward um, for the Lacuna Festivals? Going forward, we want to continue having the festivals annually. Um, and what you were just talking about being interactive, this is something that we're trying to build on each year. Um, so we have a range of participation projects and we really want that to become uh, a staple of the festivals. Um, a lot of the participation projects are actually run by festival artists. Um, and not ourselves. We run a handful, maybe four or five each year. Um, but this year we've got uh, two artists running participation projects using um, Facebook as a connection platform and a, and a platform to share resources on. Um, we have the postcard project where you can send us a postcard from wherever you are. Um, so Sarah, you're doing an absolutely phenomenal um, job with the Lacuna Festivals and it's been built upon year upon year to you know greater success, greater participation um, and evolving in a sense as well because you've got such a diverse array of uh, interactive uh, events involving the artists and the audience you know to make it an art festival um, that 360 you know that everybody could just really be involved in what are your future plans for the Lacuna Festivals? It's really lovely to hear you describing the festivals as interactive um, and sort of engaging in that way because our future plans are to continue delivering the festivals annually but to build on that um, engagement and uh, the participation of artists from around the world. So this year we have um, a handful of participation projects that um, we are running that artists can take part in. Uh, but we also have some of the festival artists have suggested their own events or their own projects or workshops, and they are leading them on a variety of platforms. Um, and so this is where we really want to go with this, bringing more of that participation and that interaction. Um, and you can see all of the things that are happening this year by going to the website and going onto the events tab. Everything's listed in there. There's all sorts going on. Fantastic. And coming back to the art side of things, who inspired you in the art world and why? So when I talk about inspiration, I look quite close to home, I suppose. And there are obviously really well-known artists who inspire my practice, but the people who actually inspire me um, day to day and what I do and my approach are people who have touched me directly in, in various ways. One of those people I've already spoke about, Kenneth G. Hay. Uh, I find him incredibly inspirational. Um, somebody called Stas Paraskos, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago now. He was my mentor when I was doing my postgraduate studies in Cyprus. Um, and he's the founder of the Cyprus College of Arts. If you're an artist and you don't know about the Cyprus College of Art, you need to get onto Google right now and start looking that up. His daughter, Margaret, is still running that as a artist community and residency. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and Joseph Danik, who is a Czech educator um, and artist, is like, a, is like a Renaissance artist in the sense that he, he can draw, he makes installations, he does performances. Um, he's, his creativity just seems to know 
no bounds. It kind of seeps out all over the place. Um, and then also there's um, a younger generation of artists, the people who are responsible for the Stockholm Supermarket Art Fair and the Juxtapose Festival um, and other artist-led events and studios. I find people like that really inspiring. Um, and it's also quite inspiring to hear about, about them um, and the impact that they've had on you. Um, in terms of yourself as an artist, what is your um, your own favourite piece of artwork that you've made? And if you'd like to tell us a little bit about that. Wow, what a question. It's, it's one of those questions that lots of artists answer by saying, oh, I think my latest piece you know and I kind of feel like that's a bit of a cop-out because in a way it's true isn't it you are always striving for something and so perhaps your most recent piece is the one that you admire the most but actually when I look back there is one piece of artwork and I still have it and it was from my from my master's when um Stas was my tutor and it's a piece that was inspired by found beach plastics. It's in a really simple but quite bright Mediterranean palette. And it just totally transformed my practice. And it was, it wasn't some kind of epic, you know, like I wasn't trying to make something in particular. I wasn't trying to make, you know, this really important piece of artwork. I was I was exploring, I was being curious, I was playing, and something magic just happened. Um, and yeah, and so that piece today still holds quite a lot of weight for me. Um, and like I say, I didn't sell it. Most of the pieces from that um, series I saw, but that piece, um, I, I've been offered lots and lots of different price tags for it but I don't think I'll ever sell it I feel like it's a, a really important part of me somehow I think that's incredibly amazing you know you yourself are an artist who puts a lot of thought into the artwork um, as a curator as a festival organizer as well so you have this great insight because you're making artwork yourself um, to be able to sort of then manage, you know, uh, a, a festival that is including a, a diverse array of um, local and international artists um, in in a global arena, you know, in, in, in the Canary Islands as well. So I think it's absolutely um, both fascinating and highly commendable the quality of thought and the depth of thought that has gone into both the lacuna festivals into your practice and you know i i for one would be keeping an eye on what you're doing in the future and how that is making an impact in the art world because in the current art scene we do need that sense of um integrity and art for art's sake rather than just mere commercialization we need that depth we need that sort of that thought process and the evaluation of that thought process behind the artistic um, practices behind the curate curation um, behind you know festivals that have a good deal of public engagement like the lacuna festivals so lastly sarah what is your outlook on future art trends I think that the future holds um, more power for artists. I think that the, the trend is going to be towards more artist-led um, events, galleries, opportunities. Um, and I think that there might be a, a political element to that. And I also think that there's going to be a, a really strong reaction, actually, against the elimination of art from education. I think that that is starting already um, sort of like a backlash, I guess, against this austerity of art in the curriculum, um, which I've seen in the UK and I've seen here as well um, in the Canaries. And I wanted to, to do a little shout out actually as well to somebody who inspires me 
from a, an art education um, point of view and definitely keeps me on my toes in terms of depth of thinking and um, critical thinking. And that is Amanda Phillips from Leeds Art Gallery, who has a depth of thought and a thought process just second to none. Um, and every time I speak to her, I come away thinking, oh, I need to you know, read more about this or find out more about that because she's just such a wealth of knowledge about art and art education. So yeah, they're my two top tips, artist-led events and um, a, a merge again of arts and education. Um, absolutely blown away, Sarah. You know, <laughs> your words are very impactful, very, I think this is one of the most powerful interviews I've done. You know, I really, really thoroughly enjoyed our conversation um, and I've been completely in inspired by it, as I'm sure the listening audience will also be. Um, thank you very much for your time. And it was an absolute honour and pleasure having you on board. No, the honour was all mine. Thank you so much for having me.